You don't really record. I'll record to the cloud. That way it'll save everything up there and then I can grab it. Okay, we're on, right? Yes, we are. <laughs> okay. This is our third third or fourth attempt. <laughs> uh, somebody doesn't want us to do this video and we're going to do it. And we're going to show them. Okay, we have our dear friends, Tim and Angela Stowe with us. We got acquainted on our trip um, to Israel. And this this acquaintance now is, is a eternal friendship with these Amen. great folks. So um, we, we somehow got connected on the bus and uh, we ended up in the same seats and we're creatures of habit. So we just kept getting on that same seat and, and we went to these incredible sites starting in, in uh, Tel Aviv and then Joppa and then Caesarea Maritime and then on to Nazareth. And I, I won't go through the whole thing, but uh, Tim and Angela really connected with us. And we, we were in a bit of a spot because our luggage got lost. <laughs> and I had a change of clothes in the, oh, ha, ha. In the carriage. <laughs> <laughs> but so tell, us, tell us what happened here. Well, our luggage didn't come in. Our flight was too close to our other flight and kept our luggage for four days, but they kept it safe. So, um, but Angela was so, so kind. She had seen me in my clothes. She knew of my plight. And one day she brought me one whole outfit to share with me because she knew that I was desperate. And <laughs> you are so kind. You're an angel. You are, you're just an angel. And really Heavenly Father put us together because there, everybody on that, trip was incredible incredible but for some reason you um really saved our life and then you told us your story and my heavens it's just it's a story that needs to be published yeah it's it's it, this this should be on um not not uh let's see what's what's the not like 2020 or anything like that it, not that not <laughs> Fine. Oh, <laughs> but it, but it's suspenseful as something like that. This is the the cool story. Now, b before we we we're gonna most of this time is gonna be you, Angela, telling us the story. But I I want to mention Tim for a minute here because as we would go to these sites, um, and and Todd Fink was our team leader and he he was amazing, but yeah. I was so impressed with Tim because. Mm -hmm. Tim already had his the scripture. He already knew the names. He already knew the story. And he knew, Tim, you knew the, the lesson learned mm. of, of, of that incredible event that took place at a certain spot. And I was like, dang, this guy knows his Bible. <laughs> and not only that, you use that knowledge to bless people's lives. You guys are the, the true Christians. And and we, in our faith, we, we, we read in scripture that charity is the pure love of Christ. And that's what you guys are. Oh, You're the God. true love of Christ in you. So with that, Angela, we want to hear your story. Every detail. Every detail. Every <laughs> <laughs> and this unfolded one day on the bus. And I'm kind of hard of hearing. So I'm like. And I have my hearing aids and I'm listening and I'm like, this can't be true. She, is, did she just say that this happened and this happened? So um, anyway, let's, let's, hear, let's hear your story. You can start anywhere you want. Okay. Wonderful. Well, thank you guys. And likewise to everything you said, you guys were the most phenomenal, loving, kind-hearted, mm. thoughtful people we have mm. met and on the bus. And it was divinely orchestrated yes, to sit was. beside you. Yeah. And we feel the same. And, and Suzanne, you saved my life. Now I know why I overpacked. So he <laughs> had to forgive me. <laughs> you did not overpack. Thank you. <laughs> to share. Thank you so much. Oh, my yes. pleasure. That was awesome. Well, 
Well, thank you guys so much. And thank you for listening to the story and being interested. I've never had two people that were so intrigued and engaged and intentional just to hear what the Lord did because it's his story. And I'm, I'm just, I'm just a vessel that's so honored and privileged and want to share it. So thank you. Yes. Thank you. But as you guys know, you too, I will share with your audience. Um, I was adopted. I was adopted in 1969 through a Catholic organization in South Carolina. And I don't know how most adopted children feel, but I felt very special. I have known as long as I can remember that I was adopted. And I felt like there was just something very special and unique about me. I just did. My dad made me feel that way. He never took anything away from me. I never felt like I was not his biological child. And um, it was the most amazing experience. Um, but we had some mishaps. Um, my adoptive family that adopted me, they, my mother and father divorced when I was two years old and they had two young boys and my mother took the boys with her. So I want to interrupt for a second. So you were adopted right after birth then, right? Yes. In fact, I was adopted at five days old. Here's a picture of me with my adoptive mother. She bringing you home, bringing me home from the hospital at five days old. <laughs> and um, they had two boys and they wanted a little girl and they actually got to go to this Catholic organization, this adoption agency and handpick me. And they literally handpicked me and I had a little wristband that said Kimberly around it. And they renamed me. My mom wanted to name me Angela. She she felt like that was the name that God had given her. Yep. So yes, this is me at five days old coming home from the hospital. But my mother and father divorced when I was two and my two brothers ran away from home to be with her. So now it's just me and my father, my adoptive father, who is the only father I know. He adored me. I was his baby. Um, he wasn't gonna let anybody else have me. So he fought for me and he gained custody of mm -hmm. me. So that's how my story started. I grew up thinking that was very normal, just having a father and no mother until I got to be a little older and kids would ask me at school or they'd come over and say, where's your mom? I'm like, I don't have a mother. And as I got older, I started realizing this is not normal. So my life consisted, my dad was a master gardener. So I was always in the garden with him, always. We were always canning. He was a fisherman. So we were always fishing and shrimping and crabbing. We would be out getting oysters in the oyster bed. I would have boots on. We would go in the pluff mud, get oysters, get clams. That's how my life was. And he provided very well for our family. He was a welder. Um, he worked at the Naval Shipyard. And so I grew up just me and my father. But when I was adopted, one of the stipulations was that I would be involved in the Catholic Church, be raised in the Catholic faith. And so my dad did that. He was faithful to that. I was very active in the Catholic church. I went to Catholic school. And then on top of that, there was an orphanage out, out of the Catholic church that we attended and they embraced our family, me and my father. And my father would always take um, uh, vegetables and things from our garden over there, fish and shrimp. And that's just how he was and the orphanage, the nuns there, they loved me and I loved them. And I became just a part of it. It was a part of my family. It was an extended part of my family. And whenever my dad would, like one time he had surgery, I was there for two weeks or he had somewhere he needed to go or things he needed to do, he would drop me off at the orphanage. So it became a live-in babysitter for me. But it also, <laughs> we would go there randomly to have meals like we would go over on a maybe a Wednesday night or whatever we go to the mess hall and have dinner with all the nuns all the orphans and I loved it it was my family we would wash dishes we and then I had my own bed and my dresser with about six people in a room in this orphanage and so they made it a home for me when my dad needed help because I didn't have a mom growing up Wow. So it was kind of a neat 
it would meet life, you know, sure it had its ups and downs, but for me, it was exciting. I had an adventurous life. I got a little trouble at the orphanage, you know, I had fun there, but. I can't imagine that would happen. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so um, time went on and I was always very curious about my biological parents, probably because I didn't have a whole family. My family was uh, divided at a young age. So I just had this desire to know family, primarily my mother, because I had a dad, a good dad that raised me and provided for me. Mm -hmm. So I started asking questions. Um, my father was very supportive. He would tell me, he said, yeah, your family's up north, you're Italian, um, but that's really all we know. And you were adopted here in South Carolina. That's all we ever knew. He said, when you're 18, I'll give you all your papers. And um, he did, he was true to that. On my 18th birthday, he gave me an envelope with all my adoption papers. But at the age of 15, I, um, I became a Christian. I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and savior. Growing up in the Catholic faith, I didn't know about having Jesus as your savior and being born again. I didn't know that concept. I found, well, the Lord found me at 15 and um, at 18, my father handed me my papers and I began at the age of 15, really began to this eight year search. And it was a lengthy, intensive search and very frustrating at times. But all those adoption papers that he gave me, I called every name on those papers, every signature. Most of them were deceased. There were judges. I remember talking to somebody that had signed off on one of those adoption papers, and he was actually a judge that was retired, still living. And I remember talking to him. He actually remembered my family. Wow. It was kind of neat. But everything was a dead yeah. end. And then fast forward, I'm 23 years old and um, I just really got serious and I was so frustrated at the end of myself. And I said, Lord, please help me find my family. If you will help me find my family, I will tell them all about you. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I think we have to get to that place. See, I think this is such a key element to this story is it's not just about you wanting to connect with your family it's that you wanted to bring christ into their life yeah, I, yeah. that is where the miracles open up with all of us mm -hmm. when you do that and this is one of those special there's so many special parts to your story but i think this one is the is the hinge point and the game changer for me is when you when you told us that, 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 that your motivation was to bring Christ in their life. I just, I just, it's amazing that you had perception at that age to, to want to do that. It's, it's so. And, you know, none of us always know our motives and it may not have started off that way, but it ended that way. And I think well, that's why I had all those roadblocks, you know, because yeah. God was working in my heart the whole time. Yeah. And it's kind of like Hannah, when she got to the end of herself and she said, Lord, if you give me a child, I'll give them back to you. Mm -hmm. That's where I got, I was at the end of myself. And I said, Lord, I'll tell them all about you. And that's where the story changed. You're right. It was the game changer. That's right. <laughs> and so um, at 23, I decided, hey, I need to go to the, I found out that the adoption agency, the Catholic adoption agency still existed. And it was here in South Carolina in Charleston. So I got the address. And um, when I got arrived at the, <laughs> when I arrived at the adoption agency, I was flabbergasted as I drove onto the property. And I'm driving through and all these flashbacks are coming to my mind. The adoption agency was what used to be the orphanage where I stayed. Mm -hmm. This adoption agency was the orphanage where I would go all the time. I had friends. I was on the playground. I was a part of them. Everything. I had a bed. I had a dresser. And my childhood was partially there. It was a big part of my life. Not because I had a, you know, because I had a need, but because my father was just such a um, loving dad that wanted me to have community with the orphanage and right. uh, so that's I drove up to this place and almost in tears over this I thought this cannot be by accident 
This cannot be by accident. This is in 1992. And I am sitting in my car getting ready to go into this adoption agency, processing all of this, overwhelmed really. It's more than you're, you can fathom. And I bow my head and I said, Father, if you will allow me to find my biological family, I will tell them all about you. And I asked him for favor. And so I proceeded to go in those doors as a 23 year old. And I was greeted by the receptionist, a young girl, and she asked if she could help me. I told her while, while I was there, I said, I, um, I was adopted through this agency and I wanted to see if I could get some information on my adoptive family. And she, she says, well, I, I don't know that we can help you with that. About that time, this woman comes through the hallway and enters into the area, to the reception area, and she introduces herself and it's the director. So I tell her my reason for being there and it was just amazing. And she invited me back to her office. And so as we're walking down the corridor, the hallways, I'm looking around and I said, one of these rooms was my bedroom. I had a dresser, I had a bed. I cannot believe I am here. And she said, what? You were adopted. I said, I was adopted, but this used to be the orphanage. She said, yeah, it did. I said, but we were very close with them. My dad raised me in the Catholic uh, faith and we became very close with the people at this orphanage. And I was like one of, I was like one of the orphans here <laughs> and she could not believe it. That right there gave me an inroad and a connection. Our hearts were connected at that moment. So she wanted to hear more about my story of being adopted. So I told her a little bit about it. And what I just told you, how my parents divorced and my dad raised me. And that kind of made her sad, really. Um, and so she, she opened, she said, give me just a moment. And she went to the file cabinet and she pulled out a file and she was sitting across the desk from me and she opens up this file and I'm looking across the desk over at it and I couldn't believe it. My baby pictures, my family that adopted me, my home. I saw my home that they took me home to. I, I just was, oh, and she said, she started scrolling down and she said, did you know that you were Greek? And I said, Greek? I, said, I was always told I was Italian. So I'd like to say, I changed eth ethnicities overnight. <laughs> so, all Mediterranean, but I went from uh, Italian to Greek. And uh, she, I, I really wanted to know some of my medical history and everything looked fine. And she, my mother is Scotch Irish. And she said, I don't know for sure, but I believe your family may still be here. And I said, well, I was told my family went up north. And she said, well, you know, I can't give you any more information, but um, that was just what she gave me at the moment. And and then she paused and she went and got the phone book when we had phone books back in that day. And uh, she took her finger, she opened the phone book and she, and she went to a page where I saw she was at peace. And I'm looking across the desk again and she takes her finger and she starts scrolling down and she says, I believe your father still lives here in Charleston, South Carolina. And I went, my, I, I mean, I'm processing all this that my family grew up in the city where I was adopted. My biological family was, who knows, I could have passed them in the store, you know, those things you go, you just you randomly think. And I took note of where she was on the page. And then she says this, she said, his last name starts with a P, his first name starts with a C, and that's all I can tell you. And so we exchanged some more pleasantries and I left there. And I know without a doubt that God instilled in me, my husband will tell you this private investigator yeah. anointing, <laughs> because I'm- like, I don't get away with anything. <laughs> <laughs> like Curtis George and God, I believe, purposed that in me so that I could have this miracle story. So I went across the street to the Piggly Wiggly grocery store and there was a phone booth there and I pulled out the phone book and I went to the peas and I started thinking Greek. Greek is very unique. 
And I come down and I find this name and I see it just stood out at me. And I thought, this has got to be it. This has got to be it. Constant Pappas. And I saw the address and it was 188 Grove Street. And we didn't have Google Maps back then. So I kind of knew the area very well, but I had to stop and ask for directions. And I finally made my way down Grove Street, drove up to his house. <laughs> and I sat there thinking, oh. and at this point, there's no turning back. You know, I've done all this investigating all these years. There is no turning back. So I go up to his door and I knock on his door. And this woman comes to the door and she this, the door is kind of cracked. And she says, can I help you? And um, I said, yes, I'm looking for a constant pappas. And then this man appears behind her and he, he kind of pushes her to the side. Her name was Poppy. And that was constant. Constant has a nickname and it's Gus. So I'm gonna call him Gus from here on out. Gus kind of says, can I help you? And I said, uh, yes, I'm looking for a constant pappas. And he says, he says, I'm Gus. He said, what, what do you want? Are you selling something? He really thought I was trying to scam him or sell him something. And he pushed his sister kind of off to the side. And um, I said, I am looking for a, um, well, let me, let me back up. At the, at the adoption agency, I found out that my mother's name was Nancy. I did, I did have that piece of information also. So I asked Gus, I said, I am looking for Constant Pappas. He says, I'm, I'm Gus. And I said, did you date a Nancy back in 1969? And he goes, Nancy, Nancy. I dated a lot of women. <laughs> and I said, well, did you date a Nancy back in 1969? He said, Nancy, yes, I did. I did. I, we dated a long time. Yes. Who are you? And I said, well, I'm your daughter. Oh, boy. He said, what do you want? <laughs> Did you, you left right from the old orphanage that's now the adoption uh, facility. It was the adoption. Or, or it was, yeah, that's right. And you left right from there to go to his house. I did. After, found it in the phone book. I mm -hmm. did. Okay, all right. So this is the same day. Same all right. day, yes. I, I, I think you're, you know, after eight years of all this research, there's nothing in me that's tactful at this point. You're not, <laughs> you're not reasoning or rationalizing. You just knock on a door on your daughter. Wow, you would not do that today. Go ahead, right on him. Okay, all right. So he says, "What are you selling? Something? Is this a scam?" And um, I said, "No, sir." I said, "I don't want anything from you. I just wanted to talk with you, and um, I'm trying to find Nancy." He says, well, anyway, he ended up inviting me in and I brought all my adoption papers with him. I laid out everything for him. He was still, he's Greek. So Greeks don't believe easily. You have to convince them. And um, he said he wanted me to have a DNA test. And uh, we spent hours together that day getting to know each other. He was very skeptical, but I looked just like her. So I, it I was undeniably uh, telling the truth, but he needed convincing. He wanted me to have a DNA test. I refused. And who was the woman that was at the door also? Okay, the woman that came to the door was his sister, Poppy. And Poppy had typhoid fever when she was four years old. And she was mentally disabled. So she had the mind of a four-year-old. And when when she heard me in the background tell Gus, I'm your daughter, I hear this voice say, how can you have a daughter, Gus? You're not married. <laughs> She's trying as a four-year-old to put all this yeah. together. And yeah. she was actually in her 60s at that time, but she had the mind of a four-year-old. So Gus took care of her his whole life. And his mother, my grandmother, uh, who, was, who got sick. So he was very devoted to take care of his family. So, so grandma was at the house. Grandma had, was deceased. Oh, this she was. Grandma, yeah, this okay. was Gus's mother. She was deceased. Okay. So um, anyway, Gus and I spent hours together. I showed him my adoption papers. And um, then I, we exchanged phone numbers. And I, from there, we went to lunch a few times. And he said, let me take you over. I really wanted to find my mom and he just couldn't help me because they had not spoken since she had me. He did not even know if I was a boy or a girl. So he takes me to the house where he used to pick her up on dates. And we drove by the house and he stopped momentarily and the grass was like up to my thigh. And I'm thinking, 
it just looked abandoned and the house looked a little run down mm -hmm. and go ahead and show this. So this is Gus, me and Gus. Oh, look at that. As many years after having a relationship, we'll get there, but <laughs> yeah. yeah that's cool. Gus. So um, he took me by this house and I'm thinking it was abandoned. So we just drove on and, um, but I got to thinking, I need to go back by that house and uh, see if anybody lives there. And so I did. Me and my adoptive brother and my sister-in-law went back to this house. And I thought to myself, surely if they don't live there, somebody lives there that can give me a lead. So I went up to the door, knocked on the door, and a man answered the door. And this was my mother's childhood home where Gus had taken me. And we thought it was taken abandoned, her, yeah. had taken her. And I knocked on the door mm -hmm. and this man answers. He says, can I help you? And I said, yes, I'm looking for, oh, and by the way, Gus did give me her last name and said her last name was Clark. And uh, I said, I'm looking for a Nancy Clark. And he says, who are you? And I said, um, does she live here? And he says, well, that's my sister. No, she doesn't live here. She's married. I said, oh, he said, who are you? And I said, I'm her daughter. And he just <laughs> goes, oh my. And he screams out. He goes, mama. He says, come in, come in. We went in. And as we're going through the living room, he's like, he's talking to his mom in the other room. He said, mama, uh, Nancy's daughter's here. And she starts calling out names. They were evidently Nancy's other daughters. And as we walk into the living room where my mother was, Bobby says, was. where my grandmother was, Bobby says, no, the other daughter. And I walk in, she's standing up and she puts her hands on her face and she goes, oh my Lord. And she kind of falls back in the chair. She knew immediately who I was. They knew about the adoption. I looked just like my mother. And um, there was just, it was undeniable. Mm -hmm. uh, I have goosebumps. <laughs> So that's, I'll be right back. that's the intro to trying to find my mother. And um, Bobby, her brother who answered the door, he says, well, I need to tell you something. <laughs> Your mother has been married six times. The man that she's married to now, we don't know if he knows about you. So give me some time and let me contact her and just ease this information on her. And actually he said, give me about two days. And he said, you know, they live over here on Boots Avenue. And he mentions briefly her husband's name, Dick Fuller. And I just kind of annotated that in my mind. I made a mental the note. Detective. The detective made <laughs> yeah. a mental note. So this is my mother. I don't know if you can see her. Yeah, hold it up to the camera there. Yeah. A little bit. Right, right. There you go. So that's you guys do. Oh, oh my heavens. And I don't know which marriage this was, <laughs> but this was one of them. <laughs> so woman at the well. Yeah, yeah right. Yes. Exactly. So anyway, I leave the house <clears throat> and um I'm thinking two days. Oh my gosh. And so my brother says to me, he says, I know where Boots Avenue is. I used to work over there. And I'm like, wow. And I, I said, he said the name was Dick Fuller. That's her husband. So when I got home, I went to the phone book, found Dick Fuller, found the address, Boots Avenue. And I thought, I need to verify that this is them. So I made a phone call to this number. And I pretended to be a telemarketer <laughs> from Savannah Lakes. That's, that's who I was telemarketing. And I got on the phone and I gave her this huge spiel about Savannah Lakes property in McCormick County, asking her if she would like to tour it. And the reason I did that, because I wanted to verify her address, her name, her husband's name, and their phone number to make sure that she indeed lived at this address. And so we got off the phone, she verified all the information. She had no idea who I was, got off the phone. The next morning, me and my sister-in-law had a brilliant idea. She said, let's go sell candy bars to Nancy. 
We had candy bars from Springfield Elementary School. I'm waiting on Bobby's call. Bobby has not called. I'm anxious. I want to see my mother. So we have this box of candy bars and we drove to Dick Fuller's house where my mother, my mother Nancy and Dick Fuller live on Boots Avenue. We drove up in my little white Sentra, got out with these candy bars, knocked on the door, and this woman comes to the door. And I said, Hi, I said, we are selling candy bars from Springfield Elementary School. We'd like to know if you can buy one. And I am not exaggerating. There was a moment, if you've ever seen a slow motion video, there was a moment in time where I, our eyes locked like mother and daughter. This, mm. it was like, I can't explain it. And I'm thinking in myself, oh my God, she knows who I am. She knows who I am. I know who she is. She looks just like me. I look just like her. And, and I, my head is spinning thinking she knows who I am because she's just staring at me. And then she stops and she says, yes, I'd love to buy a candy bar. She said, let me go get my husband's wallet. She proceeds to get his wallet, comes back with money. She buys two candy bars. And uh, we said a few words and I left. And I remember her staring at me again. And I thought, you know, I always thought I'm going to get caught doing all this. So I had this guilt thing in me, <laughs> but she didn't know who I was. The Catholic guilt thing. Yeah. <laughs> so we drive off in my white Sentra. By the time I get back home, my brother says, Angie, you had a call from Dick Fuller and he wants you to call him. And I said, Dick Fuller, how did he get my number? He goes, I don't know. He said, he wants you to call him then. So I look at the piece of paper and I pick up the phone and I dial Mr. Fuller. And I said, uh, hi, Mr. Fuller, this is Angie. I just uh, sold you two candy bars. He says, yes, young lady, we would like to buy some more of those candy bars. And I said, oh, oh, okay. He said, do you have some more? He said, we'd like to buy two dozen. And I said, um, uh, yeah, yes, sir. Yeah. And I'm stuttering over myself. And he starts laughing. He says, <laughs> we know who you are. <laughs> and I said, what? He says, when you left and pulled away from our driveway, Bobby just so happened to call. And Bobby asked for your mom, Nancy, and said, Nancy, are you sitting down? Yes, Bobby, I'm sitting down. What's wrong? Nancy, I have some important news I need to tell you. And he, he begins to tell her, your daughter is looking for you. And um, so Nancy says, she's, he, she's listening to Bobby's story. And then she says, Bobby, does she have long brown hair? Yes. Bobby, does she drive a white car? Yes, Nancy. Does she have a big white smile? Yes, Bobby. Bobby, why are you asking me all these questions? Bobby, she just sold me candy bars. <laughs> so they put it together. And Bobby gave Dick Fuller my number and they called my house. So that they, they put that together. I could not believe it. But evidently, they knew who I was because I looked just like her. Mm. And um, so Mr. Fuller says on the phone, he says, we know who you are and we would be delighted to meet you. Uh. And I said, I said, right now? He said, right now. I said, can my brother and sister-in-law come? Can we film it? He says, absolutely. So we drove over to my mother's house with Mr. Fuller, her sixth husband, good man. And uh, we spent hours over there. In 1992, I'll never forget it. That is so amazing. And it's so cool that he had a sense of humor, too. You oh, know, yeah. that just broke the ice. And so tell us how that felt to have the 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 disguises off now. Yeah. You're you're going over there and you you really get to to meet your mom for the for the first time. What, what, tell us what that was like. You can imagine um, the excitement in me, the nervousness, oh. but so happy because the one question I used to get my whole life is I always told people, I'm going to find my real parents. You know, I'm adopted, but I would always say that. And they're like, yeah, but what if they don't receive you? That's all people would ever say to me. And I'm like, 
but it's okay. At least I'll get to meet them. So I didn't really care, but I was so grateful in my heart that they did receive me. And that was, that was, that in itself was such a blessing and a kiss from heaven that God would allow them to receive me. Because imagine that kind of rejection for people that don't have such a beautiful outcome. That's mm -hmm. hard, um, especially as an adopted child. So and then when you found out about other family members. Yes. And so when I got into the house, they invited us in. We exchanged all our greetings and um, found out I have four brothers and sisters. Um, so the way it works is my mother had three. Then I was born. She put me up for adoption and then she had another one. So I have four siblings. She kept the other four, but Angela was the only one given up for adoption. Yes. Hey. But while we were there, my mother um, said, I have something I, I need to tell you because evidently she was so heavy laden with guilt. Um, she said, you almost were not born. And she said, and I'm so sorry. And she began to cry. And this was after hours of getting to know each other, laughing and having fun. But she said, um, I was not going to keep you. Gus and I were dating and Gus wanted me to have an abortion with you. And she said, and I really did not have the finances to raise you. I had three children. Um, I was barely keeping my job and holding on. And Gus said, I'm gonna take you to the abortion clinic. So he did. And this was before abortions were illegal. Or and legal. Yeah. Before they were illegal, I'm sorry. <laughs> and they drove up into downtown Charleston, South Carolina into an old dilapidated building. And my mother, Gus stayed in the car. My mother went into a basement. She went down these stairs and she said it was the scariest thing she's ever done. And she got up on this cold steel table. She did not want to go through it. And she's crying as she's telling me this because she's carried this guilt all her life. And then having to put me up for adoption, I guess there was a lot of guilt and shame. Mm -hmm. But she said, I got up on that table. The doctor had the instrument in his hand ready to perform the abortion. And she said, I don't even know how to explain this, but something lifted me off that table. Mm. She said, it was not me. She said, I don't know how I got up those stairs. My legs were jello, but it was like somebody carried me out of that basement up those stairs. And when I got to the car, I told Gus, I cannot go through with this. And so she made the decision that she was going to carry me full term. And Gus had a small beach house and he put her up at the beach house and let her um, carry me full term. Then he gave her $500. They never saw each other again. And she put me up for adoption. <sighs> and she never held me. She said she knew if she held me she would not want to let go of me yeah. so she called me um and what did they name you at they the named me kimberly they put a little wristband and uh and i was placed into the adoption agency five days later this beautiful adoptive family came and handpicked me and chose me and, and changed my name to angela changed my name to angela yes Okay, now, th this is just so incredible. There's so many directions we could go with this about, you know, abortion and all that. But you, you're a deal maker, and you made a deal. Right. With God. I did. And, and the deal was, if you help me find my family, I'll, I'll introduce you to them. That's right. So tell, tell us how maybe that kind of started because I know you and you're not going to let that drop. You're going to keep your part of the deal, right? You're going to, right. God did what you asked and now you had to do what, what you promised to do. And mm -hmm. tell us how the healing and all that kind of took place with your mom, your Thank birth you. mom. Thank you. You're a great interviewer because yeah. it helps me segue. <laughs> so I had a wonderful relationship with Gus and my mom and my siblings. It was, it was just like a dream come true. And um, for six years, my mother and I had a beautiful relationship and I would always weave, you know, Christ in there, Jesus, 
you know, having a relationship with him. But she was a Christian scientist and she uh-huh. did not, she did not believe in having Jesus as your savior. Mm-hmm. We did not see eye to eye on it. So, but we had a wonderful relationship. She filled voids in my life and her and Gus were able to reconcile because of the Lord allowing me to find them. They got to see each other for the first time in all these years meet together they put me shopping together I got I had the biggest shopping spree I've ever had in my life with my two biological parents little did I know Gus had money a little bit of money but my mom was getting back at Gus for all the pain she suffered she said I'm going to use his wallet take you shopping and get back at him that was her thing <laughs> they were able. It was a healing journey. It was a healing journey. <laughs> they were able to reconcile. She was able to totally forgive Gus and get healing. She and I were very close. And um, I was uh, previously married, and my late husband um, developed a brain tumor, a glioma brain tumor. And during that time of his illness, my mother would drive four hours to come help me take care of him because I had moved to a different city. So she would she would come and stay with me for like two weeks and help me care for him. Yeah. On two visits on two occasions. And she got sick while she was helping me. She developed this horrible cough. But Christian scientists, some of them do not believe in going to doctors. So she would not go to a doctor. Mm-hmm. Well, Mr. Dick Fuller, her husband, when I sent my mom back home, he made her go to the doctor and they ended up finding a tumor on her lung. And she ended up getting sick. And from there, she had a stroke and immediately placed on a ventilator. There were just, uh, and she went into a coma and was placed on a ventilator. I'm taking care of my sick husband who is dying of a brain, a brain tumor. And your mom. I'm sorry. And then now your mom. And now my mom. Mm -hmm. And I have two young children, a a three and a four year old at this time. Oh my goodness. And so hospice has been called in, but they're not full time. So I'm the primary caregiver for my husband. But while I'm sitting there with my husband, I feel like the Lord is saying, I want you to go tell your mother about me. And I thought, she's in ICU. Well, I get a phone call from my family that she's now on a ventilator and that I need to come in and see her. I'm thinking I'm not even hearing from what the Lord is saying to my heart, but I, I knew I had to go. And, and you're so, four away, four hours away, four hours away. So I made arrangements for family to come in and take care of my husband. And I gave my husband to the Lord because he could have died any day, but I gave him to the Lord and I trusted him and I left and four hours there. I prayed all the way there. And I asked the Lord, I said, if you want me to tell her about you, I need to be able to get into that ICU unit by myself. My family is not a believer. They'll think I've lost my mind. And so I'm praying. A young woman left my children and my husband, not knowing the future, but I'm very brave. God put that in me. I'm very tenacious. So when I arrived at the hospital and got to the ICU unit, um, waiting room. the waiting room, my sibling said, Ange, why don't you go on back there by yourself and just say your goodbyes? We've all had our moments. And I knew right then that the Lord was with me. So I entered in to the ICU unit and pulled back the curtain. And I saw my mother lay in there and she looked like a corpse. She had wires all over her body. She was, um, she was connected to a ventilator. They had absolutely no response from her at all. And so I walked up in trepidation, but I had an assignment from the Lord, I felt, but I also felt I was a little kooky, but nobody was going to know that. (laughs) And I touched her hand and I began to rub it. And I said, hi, mom. I said, it's Angie. And I just began to tell her how thankful I was that she helped me take care of Randy, told her how Randy was doing. And then I said, mom, I know we haven't seen eye to eye on our religion, but you're getting ready to die and you're going to spend eternity somewhere. And I said, you told me a story that you were up on a table getting ready to get an abortion and something lifted you off that table. And I'm here to tell you that that was Jesus that got you off that table and you gave me life. And I said, I want to give that life back to you. 
through Jesus. And I said, you know, in the Bible, uh, Jesus, and I'm talking to this corpse, this body, and I'm thinking, I have lost my mind, but I just could not stop. I told her the story about Nicodemus and how Jesus said, you must be born again. Mm. And I said, so I'm just going to pray. And I am going to believe if you would like to receive Jesus in your heart, that you can hear me and you will ask Jesus to come into your heart. So I just closed my eyes and I prayed a simple prayer and I opened my eyes and I said, mom, if you can hear me and you've asked Jesus to come into your heart, will you open your eyes three times and blink for me? I did not expect to see anything. If I could just be really real with you, full disclosure, but all of a sudden, one, two, three. And I was in absolute shock. I stood back like a chorus of angels had entered the room and I had seen a ghost. I was undone. I could not believe it. And I thought, huh, huh, God did send me here. And so I went back and I touched her hand again. And I said, mom, if you've accepted Jesus, as your Lord and Savior, would you blink for me again? And all of a sudden, her eyes just started blinking nonstop. Uh, and a tear came down her right cheek. And I knew without a doubt that she had accepted Jesus as her Lord and Savior. Mm. So the woman that almost aborted me, but gave me life and gave me a chance at life, here God allowed me, allowed me the greatest honor and privilege to give her that eternal life through Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, Amen. At 20 wow. years old, that's just a little much. But now that I'm 53, I'm like, hallelujah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, I loved how you, I know you were inspired and, and everything was under the influence of the Holy Ghost. But, but when you connected her being lifted off that table to that being Christ and that you were going to reintroduce her to that person that lifted her off that table, that to me was just, I'll bet so you, powerful. so powerful. It is, yes, it uh -oh. is. Okay, so, I, we wanna hear, we wanna hear more. Well, I'm just was gonna ask, so how long after did she remain on, on this earth or <laughs> pass? And then tell us about your husband. So a couple of days later, they disconnected her and she died. And so, um, I, uh, I went back home to my husband. I, I, excuse me. I was back home with my husband when I got the news that they had disconnected her and she passed away. That was um, in June. That was in June. Yeah. Uh, and my husband passed away a month later. August. Oh. And so my mother and my husband both passed away. And uh, it was a very, very difficult time for me, um, as you can oh. imagine. And, but I was so grateful so grateful for the moments and the season and and the god is a redeemer and a healer and a rebuilder and he literally built my life back together it was like everything in me all those little broken undone pieces of not knowing who you really are yes back together so, so that healing and that took did it have a ripple effect to other siblings and family and or like how did that all work did, yes. did christ enter into their lives somehow some way some of them so the story gets so good um i'm so thankful for the lord to give us this story but gus i was his only daughter and his only family other than poppy his sister that had typhoid fever she ended up dying that was all he had and so when poppy died this is all he had he had no other family. So it was us and our children. And so he got to enjoy life with a family every Christmas for 20 something years, every Christmas, every holiday, every Thanksgiving, you name it, his birthdays. It was wonderful. Mm -hmm. And we were able to take care of him up until the day he died. Gus uh. did not know Jesus as his Lord and Savior. He was a Greek Orthodox, but he did not, he was not born again. We, we can't, you know, religion and a relationship are two different things. And I know this very well. Mm -hmm. And we tried so hard, but we, he just, he couldn't get it. He always felt like he had to do more, work more and not receive Jesus as a savior. 
And while he was in a, was it a nursing home? Or? No, he had gone to the hospital to have a, a surgery done on a valve in his heart. And while he was in the hospital, he had a dream. And Jesus showed up on the top of a mountain in this dream. He was telling us about it. And he said, Jesus was on top of this mountain. And he was calling me up to him. And we really were able to, God had opened the door then, and we were able to kind of springboard off of that. And we, we led him to Christ. We led him to, we led him to Jesus Christ right there in that hospital. And for the next several years, he just really was able to enjoy the joy of the Lord, a relationship with the Lord, the joy of the Lord. And then from there, uh, also, Dick Fuller, my mother's sixth mm -hmm. husband, who has <laughs> the greatest privilege to lead him to the Lord mm -hmm. in um, a nursing home. Mm -hmm. My mother, uh, um, my grandmother, the one that I entered into her house, and she kind of fell back mm -hmm. when she yeah. saw me. We led her to the Lord in a nursing home. My brother, one of my brothers accepted Jesus, and that was a miraculous thing. It's a different story, but um, he accepted Jesus at the end of his life, and one of my sisters has accepted Christ. The other sister also uh, accepted Christ, but not by us. Somebody right. else had really involved with her salvation, yes. Yes. but she was prayed in. Yes, and so the vow that I made to the Lord, I have upheld that vow and um you know i pray for the others that i actually haven't had the opportunity to personally lead to the lord but i'm committed to pray for them and mm -hmm. uh see their lives mm -hmm. see them again in heaven one day wow okay before we finish this i just i'm overwhelmed with it all it's so amazing but i gotta know how you and, and tim how how you found each other wow. of the current uh path that you two are on and what you're doing and what what made you want to go to israel again this that was your second trip and just just kind of we'll, we'll, we'll kind of wrap it up but sure tell us about you two can i share this sure, sure. very briefly um i had uh gone through a di divorce i had been through a difficult divorce uh found out uh that my first wife had had a three-year affair and did not want to be married anymore. So uh, I had gone through this divorce and, and, and a friend introduced me. Here I was, a, a single dad, you know, a divorcee, a dad. I had two children. And uh, a friend introduced me to this young girl that had lived across the street, was living across the street from her. And she said, you've got to meet this girl. Man, she just loves Jesus. You, you and she's beautiful you're gonna you're really gonna like her and so she introduced me to Angela and uh so we became friends and I was just I was not a Christian I didn't know the Lord at yeah. all uh, but I was kind of ripe for the picking if you will <laughs> I was at that place where I was searching my life yeah. had not turned out the way I thought it was going to. And I was just kind of searching. I would go over to Angela's house. We would have coffee together. or I would take a pizza over for her and the kids. And we would talk and she would talk about the Lord. And I was just so intrigued. I loved it. Loved the Jesus in her. She just oozed the love of God. And one day, I guess about six or seven months after we had been friends, she said, hey, would you like to go to church with me? And I was, I was asking her out on multiple occasions up to that point. She was saying, no, no, I'm not, I'm not I'm, ready to date. Yeah. Her husband had passed away about a year and a half earlier. earlier. <laughs> and, uh, but the reality was she wasn't going to date an unsaved dude, you know. <laughs> and so... She invited me to church and we went, uh, she took me to a church that she thought I would enjoy, not her church, but one that she thought would minister to me on where I was. And it did. And I think the second or third time there, I gave my life to the Lord. I stood up. She was right beside me. I just had tears in my eyes. She did. We, I accepted the Lord. Uh, she gave me a Bible. 
she would talk to me about Jesus and just really began to kind of disciple me, to be honest. And several months after that, uh, she did agree to go out on a date with me. And, uh, and the rest, as we say, is history. We yeah. did for a year and got married, blended a family together. And um, I eventually adopted her two children to her first husband. Uh, Summer and Isla are our two youngest children. And so now I have four children and the uh -huh. Lord has just done some amazing things in our life. He really has. And you can kind of talk about where we are today. So, um... Hey, before you do that, can I ask Tim a question? Sure. Uh, we're okay. So, you gave your life to the Lord. It's 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 always exciting, and it's like you said, the tears. But there's usually a a, a period of time where it's not so easy. Right. And I, if you went through that, but but at what point did you have this thirsting for the Word of God? Because it's amazing that you didn't have that in your background. Right. And now you are just devouring the scriptures and your, you, your knowledge and everything. At what point did that happen in this journey that, that you were on? Because yours is a personal journey. Right. You know, right. our relationship with Christ is always personal. Mm -hmm. So, but you're dating this beautiful young lady. You're going to be getting married. But tell us a little bit about when that you opened up the Bible and went, I have to know more about this. Right. Yeah, that's a wonderful question. Um, you know, when I when Angela and I got married, she was 15, 16 years my senior in the in the, in the Lord, church. You know, awesome. yeah, so she had been walking with him and had all this knowledge. And I just felt like immediately I thought. I've got to try and catch up with her in terms of knowledge. And yeah. so it's, it's, so I just began to devour the word study notes. I had boxes and boxes of notes and, and things from my study. And that was all wonderful. I added a, a lot of knowledge, but I'll just be honest with you, Scott and Suzanne, uh, there were some challenging years early on. Uh, went through some very, very difficult times, the crushing, if you will. And uh, I had the knowledge, but I didn't have the intimate relationship with the Lord that you would think would come with that knowledge. And no. probably 12 years, 13 years into my walk with him, now Angela and I'll celebrate 23 years uh, of marriage next year. So it's, and it's been wonderful. She's been amazing, amazing uh, in my life, but it was probably 12 years, 13 years into my walk uh, where I really came to understand that this is not about knowledge. It's not about studying. It is, but it's more about developing an intimate relationship with Jesus. Yes, and that, that's where everything really turned. And so, so much of the application, if you will, application of the word of God, and looking back at my life and, and, and taking it forward and applying the word of God to my life and, and understanding that the scriptures speak all about Jesus. It's yeah. all about him. Yeah. And so that's, that's really where we came to today. Yeah. All right. That is Thank you for adding that. Yeah, yeah. So, so Angela, tell us where you guys are now and what, what you think about every day. Well, you know, the Lord brings everything full circle, doesn't he? Yeah, and he um, so now we are contending for the life of the unborn. I work at a pregnancy center with his full 100% support. Um, and I am a counselor advocate for the Pregnancy Crisis Center, and we help women with unplanned pregnancies, um, educating them on their options. You know, we come up alongside them. There are alternatives to abortion, and I am living proof, and I am a miracle of what God can do with a life. Amen. So, yes, that's where I am today, and we believe that God is going to just continue to 
um, lead us on this journey. I don't, I, I think the rest of our life, this is what we will be doing. And um, we're just ecstatic about it, really. I have seen women come in and, you know, really, to be honest with you, most women that have unplanned pregnancies, they're fearful. What am I going to do? How am I going to raise this child? And I understand that. And it is something that is just so uh, gut-wrenching and just such a, uh, just places in their heart that we probably don't understand. Some of them are young. and mm -hmm. But my mother got off of the table with the help of Jesus. And the Lord provides for these children, everyone that's born, regardless of how that birth takes place. Mm -hmm. My mother and father had me out of wedlock. Mm -hmm. But I'm so grateful for every moment of every breath that I have been given of this life. And uh, I think about, you know, I had a few pictures. This was the one of me um, when my mother brought me home. But look at the stages of my life. This is me as a little girl. And, you know, this would have never happened had she taken my life and chosen to abort me. Mm -hmm. And this is another picture and and now i'm a grown woman so all these stages of life they're miraculous and i just i'm grateful just to be a part of the pro-life movement amen and he is Luke, i, I do want to share this with you scott i used this picture of angela i was we were teaching a bible study i was teaching a bible study on the book of ephesians uh one time and uh, we were in Ephesians chapter one, and we were talking about how the Lord adopts us. Mm. Mm -hmm. And I used this picture and I shared just very briefly that Angela was adopted and that just like her mother and father came in and handpicked her, chose her and, and brought her into their home. God does the same with us. We are adopted uh, into him. He chose us. He picked us right. and he brings us into his home. And uh, I, I want to also add this. Ten years ago, we received a prophetic word. And uh, it was very instrumental in our lives. We've held on to it. Uh, and it was a rather lengthy prophecy. But what the primary thing that, that we've held on to is it was said that you will love a few who will love hundreds. You will heal a few who will heal hundreds, and you will minister to a few who will minister to hundreds. And we have taken that and really stepped into uh, what the Lord wants us to do here in Central Florida. And part of what Angela does is that loving, healing, ministering to a few who could and will eventually go on just to do goes, to many just others. Yes. Yeah. Ah, that is so beautiful. Mm -hmm. So beautiful. I think that's probably a good place to, to end this. That's good, Tim. Tim, what do you do? Do you help her? Do you, or do you just? Well, we, uh, Angela does the crisis pregnancy ministry. I support that 100%. I pray a lot for her mm -hmm. and with her. Uh, but we also do other things. We, I minister to men. I hold Bible studies for men. I love to minister to men. Uh, we'll minister to married couples uh, mm -hmm. if they need it. We love doing that. Uh, Angela has an outreach to women uh, and women's ministry. So really, whatever the Lord puts in front of us, that's what we set our hearts to do. We have people in prison that we have ministered to and are ministering to right now. Um, and Jesus oh. said, you know, when you've come to the ones in prison, when you've come to the home, you've done it unto me. And so we try to, we really try to seek the Lord's heart, do what he puts before us, yeah. don't we, babe? Yes. So, uh -huh. Yeah. You know, well, building his kingdom sometimes is unorthodox. Mm -hmm. And we we just said, Lord, whatever you give us to do, we'll do it. Amen. It doesn't matter what, what it is. Unto the least of these. Ah. Uh. Absolutely. That's what we learned from the Savior. Yes. He's the ultimate example in that, isn't he? Mm -hmm. he well, really is. you two are um, amazing. And you can see halos around you. You really can. Oh. <laughs> Holy Jesus. We like to say any good in us, it's Jesus, Jesus. and Jesus alone. You know that. <laughs> True. <laughs> yes. Well, okay. You guys have a blessed 
Thanksgiving and holiday season. We love season. you so we, much. We love you and we can't wait we to love you that. guys as well. We're coming to Utah at some point. We'd love to spend time with you. Yes. Love you guys. Oh, yeah. soon. Yeah. So <laughs> don't come around. Oh, it's too cold. Uh -oh. <laughs> yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank you Thank so much. You. Both of you. God bless you. We okay. love you. Love love you. You. Love you. I'll let you turn it off and then uh, we'll talk. Okay. He said, turn it off and then we'll talk. Uh...